Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning fellowship for April 25th, 2021. So we'll have our announcements and our prayer time here in just a minute. We will have our first hymn, and then we continue our march through Deuteronomy and Matthew. Then we'll finish out with a second hymn and be dismissed. As far as announcements, next week is communion and lunch on the grounds. It's already going to be the first Sunday of the month. So. And then just a note, as it's been up here before, but just a reminder, all our teaching sessions, Sunday mornings, and intensives can be found on our YouTube page. So, subscribe. And as Daniel wants me to always say, and make sure you like the videos. And click the little notification and click the notification. Now, as far as uh, our cartoon, you know, word studies are always important. Phrases as they come together is always important in Bible study. And there is the idea of literal and non-literal, you know, figures of speech, things like that. Well, I've yoked up my ox, he thought, but I did, don't see how that's going to help with the farming. <laughs> Obviously, he misinterpreted a yoke there. Well, I found it funny. But... Yeah. Any other announcements, Dr. Bubble? No. So with that, we'll go off air to our prayer time, and then we'll come back with Deuteronomy chapter 27. Right? Yes. Good morning. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27. Deuteronomy, chapter 27, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time you give us together as a local gathering, part of your body, Lord. Here together, together around your word, Lord, to study your word together, to become more mature in your word, better disciples of yours, Lord. And that's, that's what we seek to do this day. So please guide us, Lord. Please guide us through this uh, section of your word that we're going to be studying in Deuteronomy and let us learn what you would have us learn that we might become better disciples of yours. In Jesus' name, for your greater glory, we pray. Amen. Okay, well, last week, at the last part of Dr. Bailey's teaching of chapter 26, we saw the message of Moses change. We'll start again. You want to just sort of patch me in? Okay, I'm just going to start uh, with uh, where I was. Okay. <clears throat> now, last week, in the last part of Dr. Bailey's teaching of chapter 26, we saw the message of Moses change. He more or less started giving a summary statement regarding all that he had told Israel and emphasized just where they stood in their relationship with God. In verses 16 through 19, Moses said this, This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. So we see that first the Lord their God, Yahweh Elohim, commanded them to observe all of these statutes and judgments. Second, the people themselves proclaimed the Lord Yahweh to be their Elohim, their God, and that they would walk in his ways and keep his statutes, commandments, and judgments. And third, the Lord Yahweh proclaimed Israel to be his special people, which he will set high above all nations. So the covenant has been reaffirmed. God tells them to keep his commandments. The people proclaim Yahweh as being their God and say that they will keep his commandments and Yahweh declares Israel to be his special people. 
With all of that now having been established, Moses and the other elders of Israel will now give Israel specific marching orders regarding their entrance into the land. Orders which will not only affirm their obedience to God and continue to reaffirm the covenant, but will also declare his sovereignty over them and over the very land itself. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 3 of chapter 27 of Deuteronomy. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today, and it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and whitewash them with lime. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over, that you may enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of your fathers promised you. First, let's note that no longer is Moses doing this work alone. Here we see he has the elders of Israel helping him. We must remember that Israel now numbers over one million people. So getting all of these orders disseminated to everyone will take a number of spokesmen. Next, we see what Moses wants them to do on the day when they cross the Jordan. Now, it's important to note that he is telling them to prepare large stones when they cross over on the first day, but he is not telling them to place them where they need to be on the first day, because that would contradict what we learn of Israel's entrance into the land in the book of Joshua. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. These stones are to be whitewashed with lime so that the laws written on them may be clearly seen and read. Although this was a common way of disseminating news and instructions of warnings regarding terrain in those days, this particular stone installation will have a more significant meaning. We are given a clear understanding of what all is to be written here regarding the words of the law. It could be the Ten Commandments. It could be all of the cursings and blessings which we will cover. It could be the whole book of Deuteronomy or the whole law given to Moses 40 years earlier. Whichever it is, it will stand as a monument of the law which now governs the land according to God who has written this law and who has given it to the new landowners, Israel. As for how this instruction for Moses agrees with the book of Joshua, let's first read verses 4 through 8. Therefore it shall be, when you have crossed over the Jordan, that on Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones, which I command you today, and you shall whitewash them with lime. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God, and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. You shall offer peace offerings, and shall eat there, and rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. So we see here that sometime after Israel has crossed the Jordan that they will set up those stones on Mount Ebal. Moses' instruction isn't for the stones to be made ready and put in place on Mount Ebal immediately after they enter the land, only that they prepare the stones after they enter the land for eventual placement. We see from reading the book of Joshua that God took them into the land opposite the city of Jericho, which was to be their first battle in the land. You can see an approximate route from this map. Now please note the town in Ammon called Abel Shittim. In, it's, in the Hebrew text, this town is just called Shittim. And it is mentioned in Joshua chapter 2 as being the city from which he sent his spies into Jericho, where they stayed with Rahab. Also notice on this map, much further north in Israel, the city of Shechem that I've enclosed in a red box. Shechem, it's hard to tell from here, but Shechem is just about in the middle of, from, you know, looking from north to south, the middle of the Holy Land, the land being given to them. This is the location, Shechem, of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, where the blessings and cursings were pronounced. As you can see from this slide, 
One of the mounts is on either side of the town of Shechem. Now this actually took place, the placing of the stones, after the conquest of Jericho and after the conquest of Ai, and is covered in Joshua chapter 8. Israel is then told to build an altar of stones to the Lord their God once they reach Shechem. This practice given by God goes all the way back in our Bibles to Noah, where we read this in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is the first mention of an altar and an altar sacrifice that we have in Scripture. We know that Cain and Abel brought offerings to God, but no mention is made of an altar or a sacrifice until we get to Noah. And notice, this is the first thing that Noah does after he leaves the ark. We know that Noah and his family were the only ones in a right relationship with God at that time in history, so Noah must have known that an altar and a sacrifice were appropriate for worshiping their God. As we know, this practice then came all the way up through Abraham and through Israel until the final literal blood sacrifice was made to God through the death of his son, our Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. But here, for Israel now entering the land, we have a bit of significance. Moses is instructing them to build an altar once they reach Shechem, which is where God first appeared to their father Abram and where he built his first altar to the Lord. Genesis 12, 6, and 7 tells us this. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. For these Israelites about to enter the land, this is a recommittal to covenant between Israel and their God. Once again, shown by building an altar <coughs> in the land at the place where their father Abraham built his first altar to the Lord. They were to build the altar with whole stones, not using an iron tool. Historians say that the Israelites did not have iron at this time. So perhaps this was done without tools to keep them from developing any type of dependence on the pagans in the land who may have had iron implements. Or perhaps it was simply done with whole stones to show that God's law and sacrificial system does not require any type of human decoration. <clears throat> the burnt offerings, which would have been totally consumed, would speak to Israel's total dependence on the Lord. And the peace offerings, which they shared in, spoke of their thankfulness to God for all that he gave them. And then we have verse 8. And you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. It's thought that these instructions are not placed here in chronological order, but in order of importance in this chapter, making this distinct writing of the law on the stones the most important instruction in this section. The medieval rabbi, rabbinic scholar Rashi thought this instruction here was so important that he taught that when the Israelites wrote out the law in obedience to this command, they wrote it in the 70 languages of the peoples of the world. No, it doesn't say that here. <laughs> but his thought speaks to a point I made earlier, that this accurate writing of God's laws on these stones weren't only to show the faithfulness of Israel to their God, but was also to express to all who saw them the laws that were now governing this land given by the owner of the land to his chosen residence. Moses will now engage in some additional repetition, which, as both Stephen and Joshua pointed out, is a very good teaching method. Let's read verses 9 and 10. Then Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all of Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. Well, notice that now the teaching core has changed. It is now Moses, the priests, and the Levites, those who assisted at the tabernacle. Moses and these two groups might be considered the religious leadership of Israel. And this is, inappropriate, this is appropriate for the message that they're giving here. 
Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Well, this is not to say that Israel before this day had not been the people of God. This is just a recognition of their recommitment to God, that which Dr. Bailey finished up with last week, in which we began with today. The people themselves proclaimed the Lord to be their God and said that they would walk in his ways and keep his statutes, commandments, and judgments. And the Lord proclaimed Israel to be a special people, which he would set high above all nations. So in those respects, they have become the people of the Lord their God by the commitment that this new generation of, Israel, of Israelites has made. And so it is also fitting that the way in which they are to display this obedience to God be mentioned again as well. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. Please note the active, ongoing nature of this relationship. If God were just to leave Israel with a list of commandments and statutes to follow, we could see why they might easily go off track as time passed. Just like we here in the United States are suffering those who would reinterpret our Constitution and Bill of Rights to rob us of our freedoms. So too would false teachers come amongst the Israelites to reinterpret God's law. This could easily cause them to go astray, except for that opening statement. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God. Certainly it was the voice of the Lord their God who gave these commandments and statutes, but here this commandment is speaking of the future of Israel. In Hebrew, this opening phrase is not as formal as we have made it in English. The opening word here is the verb, and it is the Hebrew word Shema, as in the great Shema. You know, here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This opening phrase here in verse 10 is literally saying, hear the voice of Yahweh Elohim. The word Shema here meaning hear and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Since this is a perfect Hebrew verb being expressed in the future tense, our English Bibles say, you shall obey, speaking of their future walk with God. And the fact that it is his voice which will, they will obey, in addition to his commandments and statutes, makes this a living faith. Israel will always have godly men who will continue to convey his message and properly judge their cases according to his law and who serve as priests and who will come as prophets when needed. The truth of God, always supporting the proper interpretation of his commandments and statutes, will be provided for in the lives of Israel, for all of their generations. But it is up to them to live obedient to God's voice, his commandments, and his statutes. To help reinforce this, among the first generation to enter the land, a covenant commitment ritual will take place up in Shechem. Let's read verses 11 through 13. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. Let me bring up this slide again. Okay, here we see that there were to be six tribes standing on either mount. Actually, when you read the account in Joshua, chapter 8, you will see that the priests and Levites who attended the Ark of the Covenant stood right in the middle, and the people of the tribes stood in back of them in front of the mount designated for their tribe. Because of their numbers, however, they would have flowed up onto the actual mountain sides. Also, please note that since the tribe of Levi was assigned to Mount Gerizim, all of the Levites, except for those assigned to the Ark of the Covenant, would be on that mount. The six tribes on Mount Gerizim were all descendants of Jacob's wives, Rachel and Leah. Four of the six tribes on Mount Ebal were descendants of Jacob's two concubines, Bilhah and Zilpah. And the remaining two were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn who forfeited his birthright through incest, and Zebulun, who was Jacob's youngest son by Leah. As we shall now see, the tribes themselves didn't actually do the blessing and cursing. This was done by the Levites, with the tribes affirming each curse, which is interesting because, as we'll see in this structure, they affirm each curse. That doesn't occur when we get to the blessings. 
I guess you don't have to affirm a blessing. You just, you just enjoy it. Let's begin by reading verses 14 through 16. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen. This is actually the first set of curses. The second will be given in the next chapter in the two sandwich section of blessings between them. The Levites who are doing the speaking of the curses here are thought to be those who are standing in the middle between the, new mount, between the two mounts serving at the Ark of the Covenant. When it says, to all the men of Israel, it is thought that only the men were here on either mount representing all of Israel because their total population would have overflowed the area. These first two curses deal directly with two of the Ten Commandments. The first dealing with the second commandment, not to create images to worship. But then it adds to, and not to do it in secret. We see an example of this happening in Israel centuries later during the time of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was in Babylon, ministering to the Jews in exile there. But in chapter 8 of his prophetic book, God gave him a vision of what was taking place in the temple back in Jerusalem. You can read the details later today on that. But let me just quote one verse from Ezekiel's vision. Chapter 8, verse 12. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. This is a clear example of the behavior which is being cursed here in Shechem. I should add, though, some believe that this reference to being done in secret, although it does seem to pertain to this action which is taking place, they believe that this is a reference to all of the curses that we see on this list since m most if not all of these sinful, sinful behaviors could be done in secret as well. The second curse deals with the fifth commandment which commands us to honor our father and mother. We aren't told why this commandment is singled out here in this list of curses. Perhaps it's because it is the first commandment given with a blessing attached. The next group will deal with the treatment of others including the stranger and the disabled. Let's read verses 17 through 19. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice to the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. In verse 17, my New King James Version says, Landmark. The New American Standard says boundary mark. These refer to the markers which designate the parcel of land which you own. To move a person's boundary marker was in effect to steal their land. And we have considered previously the importance of the land to Israel. It is a gift from God to his chosen people and was split up into tribal sections by the leaders appointed by God. Once again, as the history of Israel and the land continues, we will see that this becomes a recurring sin, usually with the rich stealing land from the poor. To do anything to cause the blind to wander off the road or to pervert justice for the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow stood in contradiction to what our Lord Jesus called the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For Moses' generation, this commandment was found in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, which you can read for yourself later on. But let me just cut to the chase. Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The next set of curses deals with sexual sin. Let's read verses 20 through 23. 
Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. These curses cover a short summary of laws given in Leviticus chapters 18 and 20, dealing with immoral relationships. Notice the specificity in verse 22. It doesn't matter if your sister is your full sister or a stepsister. You are not to have relations with her. These were probably specifically pointed out because of the great immorality practiced by the pagan tribes in the land, especially in relation to their worship of pagan gods. Following God's command would help Israel separate from the people in the land that they were supposed to be driving out. <clears throat> the next two curses deal with physical violence, and the last verse serves as a collective summary. Let's read verses 24 through 26. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to say, slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law, and all the people shall say, Amen. It's quite clear that verses 24 and 25 deal with acts of physical violence. In fact, the Hebrew word translated here in verse 24 as attacks or strikes includes the thought of not just striking, but may mean striking to cause death. And it's clear that verse 25 is dealing with death, both of these in clear violation to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Verse 26 then makes it clear that this list of curses was just meant to be representative of the whole law, the Torah of God, because now all of Israel is to confirm all of the words of this law as that which they will obey. So you see, Israel was never able to say, we didn't know when they sinned against God. <coughs> From shortly after leaving Egypt, they were given God's law and had it to follow for 40 years in the desert before this giving of what the Septuagint and the Vulgate call the second law, or Deuteronomy. Now they have their detailed instructions for formally acknowledging Yahweh as their God and committing themselves to obedience to his law, his statutes, and his voice once they enter the land. And this ceremony will take place on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Next week, the blessings, and maybe a few more curses. We'll see. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for all these details you give us. It's interesting as we read through Scripture to see things that we don't get a lot of details on and other things that we do get a, little de a lot of details on, Lord. And we, just, we just thank you, Lord, and want to be attentive to everything that you give us in your Word. Lord, we're so thankful for the way you clearly spelled things out to Israel in the Old Testament, and we see how for the church you spelled things out just as clearly, Lord. And Lord, that is something that we have to thank you for daily and not ignore. We all need to be in your word every day, Lord, because we live in a world that is standing against you every hour, every minute of every hour of every day. And every moment that we spend away from your word, Lord, is one in which we are to be your representative in the world. And we have to be equipped to do that. So, Lord, please encourage everyone here, all of us, Lord, to stay in your word daily, that we may be the best servants of yours, the best ambassadors of yours that we can be in this world. For your greater glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take a break. And the people said, Amen. Amen. And you know, you said that the church did, or that the, they didn't affirm the blessing. Yeah. Maybe it's because the church wasn't there. Oh. <laughs> Amen. You never know. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>